Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Salt and Sea Community Meeting uh, on the uh, 2024 SSMP Annual Report. We'll get started here in a minute. Um, we still have some folks trickling in, so we'll give about 30 seconds or a minute or so for folks to continue to come in, and then we'll get started with our meeting. Thank you for joining. Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Um, thank you all for participating and joining us on uh, today's um, Salt and Sea Community Meeting for the 2024 SSMP Annual Report. Uh, before we begin, I just wanna go to, uh, over some uh, logistical items um, for this meeting. If we can move to the next slide, thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to let you all know that this meeting will, it's being recorded and it will be posted on the Salt and Sea Management Program website at saltandsea.ca.gov. Um, in the coming days or shortly after we end our meeting today. Um, also let you know that uh, we do have interpretation available. You can select that at the bottom of your screen. You should see a uh, an icon for interpretation. You can click there. You can select your language of preference. Uh, Spanish interpretation is available. And I would suggest that if you do select Spanish, uh, select also the mute original audio. Otherwise you might be hearing both languages at the same time. Um, and I'll repeat the same information in Spanish. Uh, bienvenidos a todos a esta reunión virtual del uh, programa de Salto en Sí eh, en esta reunión comunitaria. Tenemos hoy disponible en la plataforma de Zoom uh, interpretación o traducción al español. Para encontrar esa función en la parte de abajo de su pantalla, eh, puede hacer clic en el globo terráqueo donde dice interpretación o interpretation si está en, en inglés y seleccione su idioma de preferencia, si selecciona español, seleccione también, o le, le aconsejaría seleccionar también la opción donde dice Mute Original Audio, silenciar el audio original, para que pudiera hacer que escuche los dos lenguajes al mismo tiempo. Entonces, uh, una recomendación nada más. Y um, con eso vamos a dar por uh, comenzar nuestra junta el día de hoy. And with that, we'll get started with our meeting. Um, thanks again, everybody, for joining. And at this point, I would like to uh, pass it over to Assistant Secretary Samantha Arthur. Thanks, Miguel. Thanks so much, everyone, for being with us on this lunch hour to hear about our 2024 annual report and the work that the Salton Sea Management Program carried forward in 2023. Um, I'm Samantha Arthur. I'm Assistant Secretary for Salton Sea Policy with the California Natural Resources Agency. And I'm joined here today with my colleagues from the Natural Resources Agency, the Department of Water Resources, and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And we make up the Salton Sea Management Program. And we are carrying out restoration projects at the Salton Sea. We're working on our phase one program to implement roughly 30,000 acres of restoration projects by 2028. Um, we're really glad you could be here with us today to join the virtual option for our series of workshops. We just came off of um, two workshops that we did in person, one in Brawley at the high school there um, on Wednesday, and then one in Coachella at the library yesterday. And it was really fantastic to be in person and have the opportunity for you know, dialogue and feedback and um, to really hear from community members about their interests at the sea and, um, and, and their questions. Um, so we're excited to be able to offer, offer this in a virtual format as well. It will be a little bit more presentation style, but we'll have um, the opportunity for questions at the end. Um, next slide. So what we're going to do today is go over our annual report. So our 2024 annual report um, covers our work from 2023, and it's really a, our annual status update of what we're doing to advance restoration projects at the sea. Um, we're going to have a number of our experts here come in and talk about specific uh, projects or, um, you know, efforts like monitoring that we're advancing at the sea. And then we're going to um, invite one of our colleagues at the State Water Board to uh, share with folks about uh, their upcoming workshop 
um, that's coming soon. And so Stephanie will share more information about that. And then uh, partners at Comité Civica who are going to speak a bit about their um, community outreach, education and engagement program. Um, they were you know, great uh, helps at the, the workshops the last couple of days. And then we're gonna have a time for um, public comment to hear from, from you all and um, get your feedback directly. So thanks again for being here with us and I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Mario. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mario Llanos, Deputy Assistant Secretary for California Natural Resources Agency, uh, working here in the Salt and Sea Management Program, or SSMP, as uh, we commonly refer to it. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be here with us in this space during your lunch hour uh, to engage and learn more about our program. Next slide. So, now what we go right into our presentation is assuming the audience is generally familiar with the Salt and Sea. However, these are community meetings and we hope to continue to get new attendees tuning in for the first time. Therefore, we've decided to place a few high level slides with a brief history of the Salton Sea and current conditions. Today's Salton Sea is located in the lower basin of ancient Lake Cahuilla, which filled and dried periodically over thousands of years as the Colorado River changed courses. The Salton Sea most recently refilled between 1905 and 1907 and has been sustained by runoff from irrigated farmland and other inflows. Water management decisions, less water from Mexico, and the impact of climate change have reduced flows into the Salton Sea. Next slide. We know that deaths from the receding sea may be contributing to poor air quality and public health for surrounding communities. At over twice the salinity of the Pacific Ocean, we know the sea is now unable to sustain most aquatic life like it once did. The Salton Sea is an important stop on the Pacific Flyway for many migratory birds, and these habitat values are being lost. Finally, decades-long drought and water availability have reduced inflows to the sea, causing it to shrink. Next slide. So the Salton Sea Management Program was formed on a statute and is comprised of the Natural Res California Natural Resources Agency, the Department of Water Resources, and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. We're in the midst of our 10-year plan beginning in, eight, in 2018 to Im implement 29,800 acres of dust suppression and habitat creation restoration projects by 2028. While we are behind in our acreage targets, in the last several years, we've made great progress and continue to add capacity to carry out our work. While we've made uh, recent progress, there's still much work ahead as we continue to ramp, ramp up our restoration work. Next slide. So what's happening to improve the current conditions? As mentioned, we're operating under a state water board order to restore 29,800 acres around the sea, 50% to provide dust suppression and 50% um, to provide habitat restoration projects. The SSMP has approximately 5,800 5, acres under construction. Approximately 2,500 acres have been completed or are adding, are adding interim dust suppression benefits. We currently have about 6,000 acres of projects being planned and or designed at this time. Next slide. So if you haven't seen it, this is a picture of our, um, our 2024 annual report. Um, another requirement of the state water board order is to produce an annual report detailing the previous year's work. The annual report pictured here was released in March in English and Spanish and details the SSMP's work from 2023. It can be found on our website in English and Spanish at www.saltandsea.ca.gov. Next slide. So uh, the purpose of the annual report, um, the water board order requires that the annual report include um, one milestones completed two project acres completed, three upcoming projects, uh, four status of financial resources and permits, and five uh, departures from targeted acreages and plans to address those efficiencies. However, if you look through the report, you'll find many more details and information about our program. Next. So this is just an outline of our annual report. Um, it begins with a kind of an overview and an executive summary. 
chapter one, you'll you'll find an introduction to our program and, and the purpose of the annual report. Uh, chapter two goes a uh, deeper dive into our projects um, currently um, under construction and being planned. Um, chapter three uh, details our partnerships and the many partners around the around the region and, and that we work with, um, federal, local, uh, nonprofits, um, uh, uh, CBOs, NGOs, and how we interface and how they they help uh, this program you know achieve our goals. Chapter four is a community engagement and just talks about the various engagement opportunities um, where folks can get involved and, and the various uh, engagement op opportunities like this uh, throughout 2023. Chapter five goes into planning and the, and the many planning documents and permitting that happens um, to make these, these restoration projects possible. Uh, chapter six details kind of next steps for our program, um, what's going on in 2024 and 2025 and beyond. Um, and then we have appendices um, that describe existing conditions at the sea, as well as uh, a detailed funding status table. Next slide. So in the next series of slides, I'll run through the annual report in the order of the chapters and give high level summaries of what's detailed in the report. You may notice some page numbers on the slides. Um, these are pages in the annual report where you can find more about the slide topic. Next slide. Uh, so the first thing I'll talk about is our project delivery. Um, that's chapter two in our annual report. Uh, next slide. So land access remains an important driver of our project timelines. A critical component to timely completion and success of our SSMP project remains land access. We like to show this, this slide to show the checkerboard land ownership in areas around the sea where projects are to be implemented. Timely temporary encroachment permits for recon, geotech, and surveying, and land access easements to construct are needed by one or more landowners for each project. The state owns very little land and almost no land where we're constructing projects or plan to construct projects. This has proven to be a major obstacle in project delivery. I'll note that the Salton Sea uh, Commitment Agreement, which was signed in late 2022 between the Department of Interior, the state, Coachella Valley Water District, and IID uh, was a big step forward in, in, in um, expediting. And um, this brings historic federal funding of 250 million tied to water conservation actions on the Colorado River. These conservation actions in the coming years will lead to reduced inflows to the sea, which will accelerate the recession of the sea. This agreement has opened the door to closer and regular collaboration at the highest levels amongst those parties um, to accelerate programmatic land access agreements and add additional funding to accelerate our work. Next slide. So the next two slides, one in English and Spanish here, illustrates a wide range of activities currently being undertaken by the SSMP team and its partners towards implementation of projects at the sea as part of the 10 year uh, phase one 10 year plan. The SSMP team has undertaken an inclusive approach with public outreach at key steps to identify these future projects for development at the sea. More detail about these projects can be found in our annual report. And a good majority of these projects are currently being constructed, designed, or planned. Next slide. Again, this is a slide uh, in, in Spanish. Uh, next slide. So here to talk about our, our first major project here is a species conservation habitat um, with an overview of the project is uh, Vivian, Vivian Maisonuf from the uh, Department of Water Resources and I'll hand it over to Vivian. Vivian, you're muted. All right. So thank you all for participating in our public meeting. My name is Vivian Maisonneuve. I work for the Department of Water Resources. So today I'll go over uh, the species conservation habitat and its function and goals and, and where we are today. So again, uh, the, the world by department, Department of Water Resources, is to implement and build the projects uh, under the 10-year plan. As a first major project, uh, please, next slide. As a first major project of the 10-year plan, 
The goal of the SCH is to uh, auto suppress dust and create habitat for fishing birds. In other words, we try to recreate some of the function that the Salton Sea used to provide. The construction of the species conservation habitat project started back in January of 2021, and the ACH is uh, today essentially completed, uh, but short of having it filled with water. And I'll go over the reason uh, for that uh, a little later. So how did we achieve the goals of providing uh, habitat and suppressing dust? So essentially what we have done is impounding, creating burns to impound the water. And that water comes from the uh, new river that we can see at the center, uh, more or less, of our drawing here. And as the new river is mixed with uh, salt and seawater uh, coming from the salt saline pump station at the upper right corner of the drawing of the map here of the representation of the SCH. So we've mixed that water and those two waters and to achieve the salinity of 20 to 40 ppt. To give you an idea, the ocean water is about 35 to 40 ppt, depending on where you're located. So we've essentially created a saline environment or ocean environment uh, in order to create this habitat. There are several reasons why we chose to do this. Essentially, is to provide habitat for uh, fish, um, mainly the, the pubfish but also the tilapia, so birds can uh, forage and, and eat. Um, they were found to be providing great uh, source of food for the birds back in the days when the sea was uh, still thriving. So we also decided to mix those waters to, for other reasons, such as a selenium bioaccumulation. So by mixing those waters, the salt and sea uh, being uh, less uh, containing less uh, bioavailable selenium and mixing it with a new river, uh, we found that we'll be able to achieve uh, some much lower level of selenium in the water column and also have less bioavailable selenium uh, for the wildlife uh, uh, for which this habitat is attempted, intended. Other reason are for ONM. We didn't want to have a freshwater habitat with a lot of vegetation growth uh, because it would be extremely complicated and costly to maintain this habitat. Um, the reason for that is that we're in a very uh, productive, primary productive environment, uh, the desert, and it's fueled by a lot of nutrients in the New River. Uh, so doing so would have definitely uh, created fast growing plants and, and sort of a uh, O&M nightmare, if I may say so, uh, for us. And the last but not uh, worst reason is also to keep the existing invasive species out of the of the habitat, and mainly carp uh, and and catfish, uh, which tend to feed on the pupfish, unfortunately. So here are a few features I'd like to cover, uh, and then we'll show you pictures of them. So we have the pump station again. We'll bring the salt and sea water into uh, our uh, diversion system. The diversion system pushes the water into mixing basins with essentially are very small turbulent areas uh, where we able to mix the two waters really well since the different density we have to really actively uh, mix them. And then we have the sedimentation basin where we remove 70 to 75 percent of suspended solid to achieve better water quality. So as a reminder, it's a very large area, it's 4,100 acres. Uh, and we, the water demand is estimated to be per year roughly 76,000 acre feet per year. Uh, that means we have a pump station with a capacity of uh, 20,000 gallons per minute uh, in order to achieve that, but also to allow for future expansions if needed. So we have all the infrastructures ready uh, for uh, potential expansion uh, of, the, of the species conservation habitat. So I went over the diversion system, the mixing basins, uh, sedimentation basins. Uh, I want to also mention that uh, we have three main ponds. The east and west side are more or less independent. And I'll go over what our plans to put those ponds online uh, as we move forward with, with expansion. I want to mention that this uh, habitat project was uh, built with flooding in mind. We didn't want to have any issues with backing up water into adjacent agricultural land. So we created a very large uh, flood buffer zone, which is just north of the interception ditch on the west side of the project that you can see on the drawing here. 
We also have a Vista point and an OM facility uh, for which I'll go over uh, in a minute. Next slide, please. So to your left, you see what we've created here is a Vista point. It is not yet completed. We still have to uh, plant uh, a garden for the visitor for a visitor center. And we also have to create a cover or to build a cover for the picnic tables uh, that you see those little white squares or rectangles. There are six of them uh, in that area. We're also going to include uh, interpretive panels um, to explain kind of what uh, you guys are seeing and some of the history of the Salton Sea uh, and also of the project to present the project. So from that vista point, you'll be to uh, you'll be able to see uh, most of the of the important habitats featured at the SEH, which include the nesting island, the loafing islands, the deep water habitat, but also the shoreline habitat. You will also be located very close uh, to a pupfish uh, habitat, which is into in, in front of us right there on the picture in front of the Vista Point. To the right of the slide, we see here our ONM facility, it includes our office, but also storage area for equipment, uh, including uh, equipment for monitoring, but also for ONM. Next slide, please. On the top left corner, we have a picture of the sedimentation basin. So I forgot to mention that the product itself is 4,100 acres, and the sedimentation basin that you see filled currently are uh, together 70 acres only. So again, very large project. We had to recreate, uh, again, this function of the Salton Sea on a much larger scale. We see on the top right our uh, pumping station. Uh, again, we have three large pumps. Now it has a cover on it. That's not uh, shown here on this picture. This is an older picture. And we have here our diversion structure, which is a weir that allows us to raise the level of the New River so we can gravity feed our uh, sedimentation basin and mixing basins. Next slide, please. What I forgot to, could you please go back to one, the slide, prior slide, please? I'm sorry. I want to mention that the Pump station is located at the end of a causeway. It's about a mile long. And at the end of this causeway, we have the pump station, uh, which also provides, uh, has a uh, trench within, at, in the Salton Sea that's about three and a half miles to provide saline water as the sea is receding. Next slide. So here we have our diversion system, which includes and shows how it works. Uh, we have the east and west side. Again, sedimentation basins are illustrated here and shown here. And the mixing basins are very small, shallow area that allows us to mix both the new river and the saline water um, in, in a very active way. Um, and so that allows us to achieve this uh, 20 to 40 PPT. And those, uh, of course, are um, to, to make sure that we have the, the, the optimal conditions uh, in in our habitat, um, so the we can we can almost see them on those picture on that picture, uh, but there is a, a a very sharp distinction between New River, which is a brown color, and then the sedimentation basin. And as you go farther away uh, from the intake, the east intake and mixing basins, you see that that water gets a little bluer uh, as we drop more and more sediment. So that allows us also to remove the sediments uh, for, uh, during our ONM when those uh, sedimentation basins are starting to be filled instead of having to remove it on the entire 4,100 acre uh, current project. Next slide, please. So we have some projects in mind. Uh, this is straight, of our, uh, straight out of our annual report. We're looking at creating an eastbound for which we've already issued an order to build to Kiwit, our contractor. Uh, so this is fun. We're hoping will be complete by the end of this year, and we'll start filling uh, the pond very soon. Uh, so I picked uh, questions related to why we haven't filled the area. It's because, well, we have excellent material to impound water. Uh, that clay that we found on either side of the New River is extremely uh, impervious and allows us to, bring, to build those ponds at a much cheaper cost. Other areas of the Salton Sea are not so lucky. Um, now, it's a double-edged sword. It's, it's not only very emissive because it's that fine dust, but once it's wet, it really creates that uh, 
that layer, that very impervious layer that allow us to impound water really well uh, to create this habitat. So the pond that we're looking at at the end, if, if they're all built, uh, it's going to create a habitat of over 9,000 acres, um, at least for this or additional orange phase, uh, phase uh, plus the current 4,100 acres. Next slide, please. So the idea right now is to build uh, the East Pond this year uh, using material found onto the, the, the East Pond of the SCH. Um, so we, it, the, the way we handle this material is first we, we, we harvest it, we wet it, we uh, place it, we, and then we compact it. So there's a lot of handling, it's just dirt, but it's a lot of handling of that dirt, quote unquote, in order to make it optimal um, to, to impound that water. So this first pond is going to be uh, 750 acres. And uh, and I will be and now we're currently uh, finishing up the permitting uh, and design process, but uh, it's it's a matter of weeks. Next slide, please. Thank you, and I think that's it for the SCH. Great, thank you, Vivian. Uh, next slide, please. There you go. So next, I'd like to discuss our vegetation and enhancement projects, which are aimed at establishing native vegetation on exposed playa to reduce nest emissions. Currently, we have three project sites totaling 1,700 acres. These sites are selected because they are some of the higher emissive sites around the sea and near communities. We have a 400 acre site called Clubhouse and a 1,215 acre site called Tully Watch near the community of Salt City. Our third site is about 90 acres near the community of Bombay Beach. And um, I'll go into um, these sites and or these projects a little more than the next slides here. So, hey, Mario. Yeah. I I'm sorry. I mean, I think we have a report of your audio not to be uh, of the best quality. Did you have a setting maybe that you could try to change? Is that better? No. Nope. I don't think so. How's that? Can you hear me better now? Others? Can you? I think if we increase it, that should work now. Let me see. If we increase the volume. How does this sound better now? That's better. Thank you. Hey, I'll, I'll try to talk louder. Sorry about that. Uh, next slide, please. So here we try out uh, different watering and planting techniques. This is our clubhouse sea site that you see in these photos. And ultimately, we uh, settled on drip, um, a very drip irrigation about three inches below the surface. Uh, we selected plants native to the area that are extremely hardy, uh, to uh, tolerant to salty soil and water, and are extremely uh, drought tolerant. Iodine bush makes up a good majority of the plants, but other plants like big salt bush, salt grass, all scale, honey mesquite, smoke tree, and others were ultimately selected for uh, the plants on these sites. Uh, currently, we're planting rooted uh, plants or liners um, and seeding the area. However, after great success in seed germination, we continue to focus more on the seeding, but are still planting on a more sporadic scale. Next slide. So this slide is representative of the bale and uh, planting pattern we're using across all of our sites. The, the yellow area represents uh, phase one work for interim dust suppression in that the bales are being used to keep dust down until plants mature. They're also protecting the plants um, while we plant in between them from um, wind blown dust and uh, particles that create abrasiveness on the plants. We then came through um, through those sites and dripped and planted in between those bales in that first zone, that zone A, which is the yellow zone there. And then the purple site closest to the shoreline we, per, we refer to as zone B for bales are not placed, only irrigation and planting. Um, in the next slide, I'll discuss air quality monitoring, and I'll go a little more into the detail on why that is. But if you look at the picture on the right, um, that is actually a picture from our clubhouse feed site. You'll see the bales on the background 
the time of that intermediate area between the two zones, um, between the uh, bail ground and the and the you know the, the area closest to the uh, to the shoreline there, and you'll see the drip pattern in three lines, and they go in an array and in the in the you know in a design phase, so they're not straight lines. They kind of go and meander to the site. Uh, next slide. So early on, we designed the flow water spreading features um, or furrows and notched areas on these sites uh, adjacent to washes. And these areas during maintenance, which there have been significant amount over the last year and a half, a tremendous amount of water rushes through the site, and these furrows allow the water to spread and cheap flow across our site, capturing this water to use on our sites. This has been extremely beneficial, especially in new plant germination across the sites and carrying seed across the sites to germinate in areas we have not seeded, um, specifically in those furrows. So this is just some of the upvotes. Um, this is a newer installation where we haven't timed it yet. Uh, we'll see some existing vegetation on the site, but it's a pretty barren area. Um, this was just after one of the one of the major rain events. I think the one right before uh, tropical far Hillary came through. Uh, but you can see the water how it uses those furrows and drops down across the site through these little notches that you can barely see on the photo there, um, allowing the water to spread through the site. Next slide. So in, in, in these sites, um, particularly in Clubhouse and Tully Walk, we're seeing winds driving uh, dust into our projects from the inland, inland side of the project towards the shoreline and not the other way around. The bottom photo shows the four rows of densely placed bales covered and buried by the sand. This acts as a first line of defense. So these are all uh, dense bales that cover the outer edges of our project. Um, we placed trans a transect of three air monitoring station across all our sites to monitor the performance of our actions. We're finding a 95% reduction from the upwind monitor to the downwind monitor showing the bales are working to keep windblown particles at the ground level from kicking up more dust on their sites. For this reason, or this is the reason for the zone A placement of bales, stopping about halfway down towards the shoreline. Plants downwind in the purple zone B areas seem to perform just fine with no bales because of the protection from the bales on the upslope side. So you can see, uh, you know, the, the bales stop about halfway or a little more than halfway. And, um, just uh, showing on the bottom photo there, you'll see the uh, covered bales there from the wind, you know, the sand blowing into the site, protecting, you know, the, the sites um, and the plants that are through the bales there. Next slide. So this is, uh, so this is, uh, here on the left, we'll see a new installation of the bales providing interim dust suppression very early on after bale price placement. And on the right is a photo of about a year's worth of growth between the bales. This is really what we're hoping for um, and really the early success that we're seeing in a year's worth of growth. Uh, next slide. Hey, Mario. Yeah. We're, we're still getting some comments here that your sound quality is not coming in great. So I'm going to take over and let you fiddle with perhaps calling on your phone here and I'll take over on these slides. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay. Hope everyone can hear me better. Um, so taking over where Mario left off, he's highlighting our vegetation enhancement projects. Um, and these pictures are showing after seeding and, and what we've seen at Clubhouse after a year of growth. So these are recent um, aerial drone photographs. And so you can see the, the bale placement and then you can see the native vegetation that's, uh, that's really sprouting up and providing that, um, that wind break that functions to keep the dust down. Next slide. Okay, we also highlight in our annual report our collaborative projects um, that we're doing uh, as support with partners who are leading projects yeah. at the at the Salton Sea. Um, the Audubon Bombay project is a proposed wetland enhancement project um, near the community of Bombay. It's 564 acres. Um, the Desert Shores Channel Restoration Project and then is led by the Salton Sea Authority, um, working with their implementing partners at Imperial County. 
And then the North Lake Pilot Demonstration Project, which is also led by the Salton Sea Authority with their partners at Riverside County. And the Salton Sea Management Program is working to support these projects. Next slide. Uh, we're also listing here additional projects that are in the planning phases. So we move all of our projects, we like to refer to it as a pipeline. So first we have to do um, kind of the conceptual uh, process to envision what a project can be, and then do the specific on the ground investigations, the biological um, surveys, the geotechnical surveys that will inform what is possible at a particular site. And then we, that can move to um, design and then eventually out for construction. So these are projects um, that we're listing here to uh, that are identified in our planning stage and that we're moving through that project pipeline. Next slide. Can you hear me better? Yes, that is better. I'm on a roll though. Let me finish this one. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, we also released this year our um, project tracker. So we definitely invite everyone to go onto our Salton Sea website, which is uh, www.saltonsea.ca.gov. Um, this was a, a you know, about multi-year effort here to really capture the details of our project work and share them in a way that we hope is accessible to the public and allows folks to really understand from a number of different angles um, what these projects are doing, the stages that they're in, the acreage extent of them, and the types of benefits that they provide in terms of habitat, in terms of dust suppression. Um, and that's that's what we're highlighting here. On this page, you're looking at a uh, like a summary dashboard where we're specifically showing our reporting towards our required 29,800 acre um, state water board order and where we are in um, the project pipeline for that. But if you look at the top of the banner here, there's lots of different buttons to click and explore these projects in more detail. They each have associated fact sheets and we're really institutionalizing this so that we're gonna be updating this every uh, twice a year uh, so that we can provide up-to-date information on the status of our projects and those partner-led projects that are able to input information as well. Okay, Mario, I'll pass it back to you. Great, next slide, please. So next I'll talk about partnerships and community engagement on uh, next slide. So I went through, I won't read through the, the list here of partners, but these are um, partners that we work with that make you know our project possible collab through collaboration. Um, and if you go through our annual report, you'll see a lot more on how we collaborate with uh, these partners listed on, on the slides here. Uh, next slide. So the SSMPs put a strong emphasis on partner tours of the SCH and our vegetation enhancement sites. The SCH has hosted dozens of tours over the past year. Additionally, we've developed a roadshow type presentation and are participating in, part in partner meetings and city council meetings in Imperial and Riverside County. Next slide. Um, next slide, please. So environmental planning. We continue to work uh, to finalize our phase one 10 year plan uh, environmental assessment for NEPA coverage. When complete, this will cover all SSMP proposed restoration actions for expedited permitting. A final key uh, step in this process was releasing a programmatic agreement for section 106 and releasing it for comment by the federal cooperating agencies in uh, March, 2024. Response to comments is nearly finalized and we anticipate this environmental assessment to be completed in June, 2024. Next slide. So the Salton Sea Management Program prepared this draft long range plan or LRP to comply with a state water board order at the end of 2022. It was developed with the support of uh, tribal leadership, community based organizations and local state and federal agencies. The draft plan identified concepts for long-term restoration of the sea beyond the scope of the SSMP's phase one 10 year plan. Uh, during 2023, the SSMP relieved, released a draft for public comment. Earlier this year, the final LRP was released in English and Spanish. All of the public comments received were compiled into an appendix um, and added to the final LRP that was released. 
The final LRP incorporates changes that came from the draft review, as well as new air quality modeling that was developed in response to the public comments. These comments were also transmitted to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for their consideration and review in the development of the Imperial Stream and Salton Sea Ecosystem Restoration Feasibility Study. Notably, in response to the comments submitted to the state, the Corps convened a Future of Hydrology workshop earlier this month to further analyze and build upon the modeling of the future hydrologic conditions developed for this LRP. Next slide. The LRP is being used as a starting point to inform the Imperial Stream and Salton Sea Ecological Rest Restoration Feasibility Study. That study is being led by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, and sponsored by DWR and the Salton Sea Authority. This study is currently under development. And next, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Charlie Land with the Department of Fish and Wildlife to discuss our monitoring implement implementation plan. Hi, everybody. I'm Charlie Land with the CDFW Salton Sea Program. I'm glad uh, so many people were able to join us today. And I'm going to give you a quick overview of the ecology of the Salton Sea and talk a little bit about our uh, first annual work plan, the 2024 annual work plan for our monitoring implementation plan. As, as most of you know, the Salton Sea is a terminal lake, and that means it has no outlet to the sea. So the dissolved minerals that flow into the sea uh, stay there when the water evaporates. And of course, more water actually evaporates from the sea that flows into it. And over time, this has caused a increase in the salinity of the sea that has been, actually been accelerated by some water transfers in the region. So this has resulted in uh, changes in the ecosystem, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. But first, next slide, please. I'm going to talk a little bit about the monitoring implementation plan. So this is a regional scale monitoring plan for the Salton Sea ecosystem. And it, it uh, excuse me, I, it is a planning document, not a regulatory document. And I'm gonna just go over the uh, goals of the MIP a bit. So it's to, the goals are to identify and prioritize monitoring activities that measure current and future conditions within the Salton Sea ecosystem, establish milestones against which the data gathered during long-term monitoring can be compared, establishes methods for measuring and reporting these metrics, identifies and prioritizes the existing data graphs, and describes a framework to store, manage, and mo make monitoring data publicly available in a timely manner. And this, uh, document is available at the Salton Sea website. And part of the requirements of the monitoring implementation plan is to develop uh, an annual work plan. And this is the first one that they, we've actually done. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, next slide, please. These are the resource areas covered by the plan and their hydrology and water quality, air quality, which Mario was talking about. Uh, geography, you can think in terms primarily of land cover, biological resources, socio socioeconomics, and data management. So mostly I'm gonna be focusing on the biological resources uh, monitoring. And so each work plan is actually developed uh, in the, the fall of the uh, preceding year for the upcoming year. And as I said, this is the first one that we've actually developed and is focused on the existing monitoring activities, the things that are currently occurring and planned for the immediate future by the various entities that are cooperating in uh, the development of this monitoring plan. So those entities, Entities include CEFW, DWR, CNRA, the Regional Water Quality Control Board, and other partner entities. 
Um, there are some current limitations on our capabilities that uh, are a result of the changes in the ecosystem. The shoreline receding, for example, has uh, made some of the boat ramps, pretty much all of the, most of them, unusable for most boats. But uh, these limitations, uh, and we also have a need to uh, replace some aging equipment and to uh, acquire new equipment to conduct some of the activities described in the map. But we, uh, uh, it's our expectation that uh, we'll be able to address these uh, limitations as new staff, new equipment, and new infrastructure is added to our system. And with the help of uh, many partners, we anticipate the monitoring activities to expand and evolve in future years. Next slide, please. Uh, we seem to have gone back uh, to the incorrect slide, but um, uh, next slide, please. All right, that slide was out of place. Apologize for that. I'm just gonna mention some quick facts about the Salton Sea. Um, it is a diverse ecosystem. It is a migration hotspot or the Pacific Flyway. It has a high density of burrowing owls. It's uh, Imperial County is probably the, the most dense population of burrowing owls in the state. It's an important inland nesting area for many migratory birds. And the basin is the home of the endemic and state and federally listed desert pupfish. Uh, I just want to mention that the Pacific Flyway, um, this uh, the Salton Sea is an uh, important stopover and wintering locations uh, within the Pacific Flyway, and that's uh, its importance has probably uh, increased um, because of the loss of some other wetland habitat. Next slide, please. So in previous years. The when the sea was roughly the salinity of the ocean, uh, marine fish species were stocked in the sea. Over time, the salinity increased, and those uh, fish species uh, uh, declined, and the system became dominated by salinity tolerant uh, tilapia species. Uh, we last encountered the uh, marine species in 2003. And then as time has gone on, the, the, with the release of the comp competitive pressures and depredation of the marine fish species on the tilapia, the tilapia actually ex experienced a population expo explosion. And then in their turn, as the salinity increased their population, declined as well. Uh, it seemed to, uh, the most precipitous part of the decline seemed to coincide roughly to when the end of the mitigation water uh, occurred in uh, 2017, that was part of the QSA. Next slide, please. And as the fish population declined, so did the population of uh, the fish eating birds that depended on them. This is a slide that indicates the, the populations of uh, double-crested cormorants, American white pelicans, and brown pelicans. And you can see the decline in these species pretty much coincide with the decline of the fishery. Um, just to mention that in the past, uh, this the Salton Sea was the wintering location for roughly a third of the white pelican population of North America, and it was the largest inland breeding population of cormorants. Next slide, please. And um, it also, the increasing salinity of the sea also affected the endemic desert pupfish. As the sea in, increased in salinity, it uh, became uh, the salinity exceeded the tolerance for the species. Even though it is very tolerant of high salinity, high temperatures, and low dissolved oxygen, um, it finally has uh, exceeded the capability of this species to tolerate uh, the high salinity levels. 
and consequently the shoreline habitat that previously connected the drainages where they reside um, became unusable and the fish have become isolated in the, the individual drainages. Next slide, please. These are some of the activities and species that CDFW currently works with. On the right, you can see one of our staff members establishing a, a new survey point for marsh birds and rails uh, in emerging wetlands that have become established on the exposed playa. Uh, top center is a burrowing owl. Uh, top left is desert puffish. We have a pelican fishing in the lower left. And the lower center photo is uh, one of the last uh, colonies of the Piscivorous birds. Uh, this photo was taken at uh, Raymer Lake. And over time, or in the future years, we plan to also uh, start reinitiate re uh, fish sampling and initiate the sampling of macroinvertebrates and plankton in the sea. Next slide, please. This is an airboat. This has been the workhorse of our work on the water, but it does have some limitations. And in recent years, our uh, ability to get on the sea has been severely limited because as I mentioned, most of the boat ramps became unusable as the shoreline receded. But in 2023 at our SCH construction site, um, the boat ramp was made available to CDFW and we've been able to get back on the, the water again. And this boat ramp is used for a variety of purposes, uh, including coordinated shorebird counts, uh, accessing areas where we uh, survey for rails. We'll be using it for fish sampling as well as the macroinvertebrate and plankton sampling. And we also assist with the the regional water board by providing transportation so that they can uh, go out and take water samples on the sea. Next slide, please. And we've also added a second boat to our, uh, why laughingly referred to as, uh, as our fleet. Um, this boat, uh, having a second boat increases our uh, ability to keep workers safe by having a, a rescue boat available when the other boat is on the water as well as being able to uh, conduct some activities that an airboat is not suited for, like setting fish nets. So this is a joint re regional water board and CDFW sampling trip for sediment and water samples. And that's it. I, uh, I'll turn it back to uh, Mario. Great, so um, I'd like to talk about our, our Salt Sea Community Needs Reports. Um, over many decades, community members and organizations have advocated for multi-benefit infrastructure projects at the Salt Sea to address a range of community health, environmental, and economic needs. However, limitations on the use of bond funding, cost, and regulatory, technological, and ownership challenges have posed barriers to integrating these into the design of SSAP projects to date. In recognition of the greater need of investment in the historically underinvested communities at the sea, CNRA supported the development of a Salt and Sea Community Needs Report uh, with our contractor, Better World Group. As a result, the Salt and Sea Community Needs re and Recommended Actions by Better World Group was produced to uplift the greater needs of the Salt and Sea region and recommended actions. The Salt and Sea Management Program then produced the Salt and Sea Management Program and community needs report that takes those needs and applies it to our restoration work at the sea. Um, the eight surface needs analyzed were community engagement, meaningful tri tribal engage, uh, consultation, equitable outdoor access, public health, workforce, and economic development, climate resilience, transportation, and broadband access. Next slide. The reports were developed over a two-year per period. Better World Group reviewed publication studies, public comments, and reports over the last decade to inform this process. The SSMP and Better World Group convened a Salton Sea Regional Benefits Working Group of partners in the region and held a series of meetings around the surface needs. Several tribal focus groups were convened for their input on the reports as well. 
Federal Road Group held over 60 interviews with community residents, community-based organizations, federal, state, and local governments, and philanthropic, educational, and healthcare representatives. Finally, with the assistance of the Salt Sea Authority, we had local community-based organizations in the region, ground truth findings in communities near the Salt Sea, which include feedback from 255 members of the community and five virtual and in-person focus uh, groups. Earlier this year, we released both draft reports for a 60-day comment period. In that comment period, the SSMP led two in-person community meetings in Imperial and Coachella Valley and had one virtual meeting. Currently, we are processing the comments and feedback for inclusion in the two final reports, which we plan to release in June 2024. Next slide. To date, approximately 560 million um, in state funding has been appropriated to the Salton Sea. As part of the $250 million federal commitment to the Salton Sea, the program has received $70 million, which will primarily go to the expansion of the SCH that uh, Vivian discussed. The SSMP has requested $65 million in the 24-25 budget, be negotiated now for uh, continuation of planning, design, and implementation of the identified near-term set of projects. Uh, next slide. In uh, chapter six, our final chapter of the annual report, we in detail summarize SSMP activities for this year in 2025. Very high on the list is finalizing our environmental assessment for NEPA coverage to expedite our 10 year plan projects. Our, our pri primary focus is to expand the SCH project using the 70 million in federal funding and continue to complete our veg enhancement projects um, on our current sites and transition to new sites to complete dust suppression acreage. Finally, we continue to support the development of the feasibility study in partnership with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the Salt Sea Authority. And that concludes my presentation. Hey everyone. Um, hi everyone. I'm sorry that my camera's kind of at a weird angle here. Um, I am Stephanie Holstitch. I'm a senior environmental scientist with the State Water Board, and I'm here today to invite, uh, extend an invitation for everyone here to attend our upcoming um, Salt and Sea Management Program annual workshop. And go ahead to the next slide, please. Um, so our workshop is coming up um, on May 22nd from 9 a.m. until around 7 p.m. Um, State Water Board members will hear um, the SSMP team's annual update on the Salton Sea Management Program. Um, there will be panels that will present on local projects in the feasibility study. And then interested parties will also have multiple opportunities to provide public comments throughout the workshop. Next slide. Um, the Due to the budget deficit, the in-person location for the workshop this year will be at the California Environmental Protection Agency headquarters building, which is in downtown Sacramento. Um, we are hoping to return to the Salton Sea next year. And there is a remote viewing location for those that are in the area and would like to attend and watch um, the workshop or provide public comments. Um, they can do so at that location at the Region 7 um, Water Board office in Palm Desert. You can go, to, go ahead to the next slide. Um, there is also um, the option to participate via Zoom if you would like to provide public comments or if you would like to um, just watch only, there is also a, a webinar option. And all of the options for participation will have Spanish interpretation available. Next slide. So here's our workshop agenda. Um, at the workshop will begin at 9 a.m. with introduction and opening remarks. Um, following that, there will be an opportunity for any elected or tribal officials or their designated representative to provide comments. Then there will be a water board um, staff presentation. Um, following that, um, the Salt and Sea Management Program team will provide their phase one update um, to the board. Um, and there, there will also be a board Q&A as part of that. And then there will be an hour public comment period or so, depending on the number of public comments. And then we'll move into a break from 1230 to 2. Um, it may be shortened depending on the number of public comments received. 
And then once we return from break, um, we'll begin the panel. So the first panel is overview of local agencies, partnership, salt and sea projects, which will also include a board Q and A. And then the second panel will be on the feasibility study. And again, the format will be presentations followed by a board Q and A. And then we'll close out the workshop with two hours of public comments and um, board member discussion and closing comments. Next slide. Um, so here's some more workshop details. Um, we request interpretation. If you need interpretation in a language other than Spanish, the deadline for that is today. Um, written comments are due to our board clerk by May 13th. And um, our workshop notice on our webpage has information about how to provide those comments to the clerk. Um, our board clerk also just today sent out the agenda item, which has information about um, like a staff report and more information. And that will be going out as well to our um, listserv for the Salt and Sea. And then coming soon is the final day of agenda and speaker card form for if you'd like to provide comments um, during the Zoom meeting. And here you can subscribe to updates. And we also have our webpage in both English and Spanish. Um, and that those are the links to those there where we will post additional information as it becomes available about the workshop. Next slide. And um, there's my contact information. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you have any comments or questions. And thank you so much. And we look forward to having your participation at the workshop. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon. My name is Isame with Comité Civico del Valle, and it's a pleasure to um, be here. So just um, really quickly, I want to also um, introduce myself. I'm Isame Pasillas with Comité Civico del Valle with the Salton Sea Community Outreach Education and Engagement Program. Next slide. Next slide. Um, the Salt and Sea Community Outreach Education and Engagement Program has been created to help children, students, school personnel, parents, local leaders, and community at large learn about the Salt and Sea, be aware of its current situation, understand the impacts it has on their health, be more participative in the decision-making process, and be aware of the short-term and long-term plans for the management of the Salt and Sea. And in our next slide, um, these are some examples of what our typical outreach opportunities look like. And we understand the, the information and, and how important it is to create those bridges and help create more um, relationships with um, community members um, around the salt and sea. So um, next slide. This is an example of what the program um, has implemented with some of the schools under the air notification school flag program. And so these are some visual examples of what the plan of action is with um, some of the schools near the Salton Sea. So um, with that, um, I wanted to introduce uh, the program. And again, if you have any um, additional you know, opportunities, if you want to learn or seek out more information in regards to all of the information you learned today under the 10-year management plan, the long-range plan, um, we help and can provide that additional information through tabling, resource fairs, presentations. And yeah, so um, thank you. Next slide. And with that, I'll hand it back over to the CNRA team. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. May, and thanks, everybody. Uh, this brings us to our tail end of our, of our meeting. Uh, we do have a, a quick survey to share with you. Um, if you can uh, do this um, when you get a minute, we have a, a short survey uh, just to let, help us uh, know a little bit more on how we can best uh, improve our meetings in the future. As you heard before, we had two in-person meetings and this webinar. So um, take a minute of your time and respond this on your own. Um, also, the link will be posted uh, on the chat box. So um, again, once you get a minute, feel free to give us your responses that will help us shape the future meetings. Uh, and if we can go to the next slide, please. And this will take us to a public comment period. Uh, please uh, 
help uh, help us by raising your hand use, using the raise hand feature on your Zoom. If you would like to comment on on this presentation and the 2024 annual report, uh, if you're on the phone, which I don't believe we have anybody on the line, but you can also press um, pound two, and that will let us know that you want to uh, that you have a comment for us. So um, please, uh, you know, we're uh, short on time here. Uh, so please uh, limit your comments to no more than three minutes. And I do see a couple of hands up. If we can, uh, uh, I'll let you uh, unmute first and then uh, and we can hear your comments. And uh, also see that there is some questions in the Q&A box. Our team is going through them as we speak. Uh, we'll hope to get through through those um, before the end of our meeting. So first, if we can have uh, Ms. Lena Garcia unmute. <coughs> Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Could you guys hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Um, so my first question, I did put it on the on the chat. So it is, what type of uh, monitors have been deployed? And this question was asked back, I think it was last year in January in the Cala Patria uh, meeting that we had with all of you. And it is unacceptable. Uh, Mr. Mar Mario Yanas still does not know that question. So I think this has been a great issue with all of you from the Natural Resources Agency. Um, my second concern is I did reach out to you, Miguel, and I did inform also Lisa of the complaints that were coming in from Bombay Beach, how the hay bills are affecting the community. Um, this has not been addressed and we're not too happy about it. We did have the EPA from Region 9 and Region 6 on Wednesday they are very concerned and they asked us who approved the hay bill. They were in Bombay Beach and a community advocate did inform them of all the issues. I We also took them to Johnson Landing and they were surprised how the, just, you know, just how this project is happening. Um, my understanding is there is no peer reviewed documentation stating that this is a, uh, a good project for the area. It was a failed project in Owens Lake. So my biggest concern is that you all have dismissed and have ignored the community's concerns. You guys are not working with the community whatsoever. Um, it looks nice on paper and I, I'm just going to ask everyone to be more diligent and to respect our community because you guys have not at all. I do have colleagues in the Coachella Valley that you guys have also ignored and it is unacceptable. Um, Mario Yanas, for you not even to know what monitors are deployed. Um, we will be this in this month in the meeting, we will have community advocates. But like I said, you guys are not protecting public health. And that's, I guess, my question to you guys. What have you guys done to protect public health? Because the hay bills is not protecting public health. That is on the order itself. And you guys have not abided by that order. Thank you. Thank you, Lillian. Um, thank you for those comments. And um, you know, we we've uh, coordinated with uh, with CARB and other and other um, partners, uh, particularly on the vegetation enhancement projects. Uh, also, fair to say that we haven't seen much success on the Bombay Beach area for the vegetation enhancement projects. We've been out there in the community um, with uh, with presentations. We brought in uh, or, or, or the lead for for this project when. The person that's actually uh, leading the uh, who's Stephen Garcia, who's leading the uh, the workers out there, and what the project is looking like, and also the 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 challenges that we faced on that project. So uh, we continue to hear uh, the community, uh, but again, we haven't been as successful as uh, other project sites around the zone, see the Tule Wash or Clubhouse, uh, that have seen more more progress uh, as far as vegetation growth out there. But thank you. Uh, next, if we can have. Uh, uh, somebody by the person I am. Yeah, hi. I am Iron Dad. Um, I am an environmental activist. I am a resident. I'm also a resident of Bombay Beach. Um, as part of my efforts, I do an annual run around the sea to track the current shoreline. And um, I uh, have some concerns that are shared by members of our community about the hay bales that have already been brought up that were put uh, to the west of Bombay Beach. Uh, one question I have is, I know that one of the air quality monitors is 
uh, very close to that project uh, up on Avenue A within um, a quarter of a mile. And also that project is only 90 acres. So it doesn't move you very close to your uh, acreage goal of 30,000. Is there, um, it was prioritized obviously and installed without really a lot of consultation with the community. Could it have been prioritized because that would have a, uh, a significantly larger impact and I would say uh, like a somewhat deceptive impact on the air quality particulates, I'm talking about particulate matter in particular, measured at that permanent air monitoring station, of which I believe there are four around the sea. Could that be the case? And then a follow-up question, we also are about to get another project that is not under the auspices of the SSMP on the other side of town, blocking us in on both sides. Um, this is a project that's currently under development by the IID as part of their QSA obligations. Does the SSMP have any influence over that project? Because we're also, we have a lot of questions and not a lot of people talking to us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Sam, I see that you're on. I'm not sure if you want to address part of the question. Sure, happy to. Just wanted to turn my camera on as well um, for this portion. Um, thanks so much for, for comments. In terms of prioritization, I um, wanted to mention that the vegetation enhancement projects are, are um, an outgrowth of some of the work done in the dust suppression action plan. And our prioritization of projects is through the lens of um, areas that have uh, more risk to be emissive. Um, so that's where we focus the, the early action. Um, and then the, the, the question about um, mitigation actions uh, from Imperial Irrigation District, those are um, kind of separate function and not part of the Salton Sea Management Program. But we do, but I will mention we coordinate in terms of kind of where we overlap and um, in terms of where projects uh, may be located so that we make sure uh, we know we're not in the in the in the same locations. And I'll just add that the monitoring stations that are being placed on the veg enhancement projects are monitoring the performance of the projects themselves and um, specifically at Bombay Beach are monitoring um, any dust coming off the site of that project location. So that's what they're primarily um, uh, monitoring. And I do apologize, I don't have the exact model and make of the um, air monitoring station, but I will get that to you, uh, Ms. Garcia. Um, if there's a specific one you're looking, looking for, if you can email me, I'll uh, get that over if I get your email address and I'll check with our engineers to get that model. And the reason why the uh, Bombay Beach project is not tracking like the clubhouse projects is that we did, uh, we are using, you know, one thing I failed to mention is we are using groundwater wells to water these sites. They are in areas that we don't have flows coming into the sea. Um, so we're using groundwater to water these sites. And we did drill very early on at Bombay Beach um, down to 800 feet and did not find water out there. And so that's why you don't see the success that you see on the other side of the sea at Bombay Beach. However, the bales are still providing interim dust suppression by keeping the dust on the, on the site and um, reducing that saltation. So dust kicking up other dust at the ground level um, across the site. And so I just wanted to kind of make that clear that, 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 yeah, they're not growing like the other site because there's not water at that site. And we're currently working on that and we'll begin planting in the fall to get a temporary um, construction meter to add water to the site and begin to get the same and hopefully the same uh, results that we're seeing over at uh, Clubhouse and Tully Wash sites for um, uh, vegetation. And on this same um, question or from, from the same attendee, um, just wanna reiterate the first question about uh, um, the prioritization of this project, um, and I'll read it off uh, verbatim as it is, um, was the uh, vegetation enhancement project uh, at Bombay Beach prioritized because of permanent air monitoring station is located in its proximity. 
So I'm not sure if I can expand on that. Good afternoon, everyone. I can answer that question. So that particular project was prioritized based on the public outreach we had conducted at the time. We were looking at areas around the sea and its relative emissivity and looking to prioritize sites that had the most potential to become emissive. So based on the feedback of the community, we were looking for a location on the eastern side of the sea that was located in close proximity to a community that we could justify siting a project there based on the data we had available at the time. And that's why the Bombay Beach site was selected. So hopefully that's helpful. Thanks, Yvonne. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see any other hands up. If you have any questions or comments, um, you could always email it to us, um, but we still wanna do our last round. If anybody has an additional comment, please feel free to raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, I think we can move to our final slide. And again, um, if you have any further comments uh, on our annual report or in the work that's happening at the Salt and Sea by the Salt and Sea Management Program, we can always reach us at um, cnra-salt and sea at resources.ca.gov. And also to reiterate the or Salt and Sea website, salt and sea.ca.gov, uh, you can find the annual report there, past reports, long range plan, the community needs reports some of those documents that were uh, referenced here in today's presentation. Uh, so with that, I would like to take, thank you all of you for participating on this webinar and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all. Thanks everyone.